So uh, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the inaugural session of the Critical Legal Talk series. I'm Alexis Alvarez Nakagawa, the host of the series, uh, which are co-organized by the Law Department at Queen Mary University of London and the Group of Critical Studies in Politics, Law and Society, uh, or PODES, at the University of Buenos Aires. We have the pleasure and privilege of having Professor Marty Koskenyemi with us today. Marty does not need any introduction, as it is commonly said in these occasions, but as I have to validate or justify my role as a chair here, let me uh, just say a quick, uh, very quickly a few uh, words about him. So Marty Koskeniemi is Professor Emeritus of International Law and Director of the Erika Stren Institute of International Law and Human Rights at the University of Helsinki. He has held several visiting professorships at many universities around the globe, including uh, at the University of Cambridge, NYU, the LSE, and many other places. He has received an honorary doctorate from the universities of Uppsala, McGill, Frankfurt, Tartu, and the European University Institute, or UI. Uh, his main publications include, and I, I will just mention his books because I won't have the time to enumerate all the many papers that Marty published over the years. So his uh, main book publications include From Apology to Topia, published in 1989 for the first time and read and then reprinted, I think, in 2009, uh, 2005, if I'm not wrong. Uh, the Gentle Civilizer of Nations, published in 2001, and more recently, his important to the uttermost parts of the earth, legal imagination and international power, which came out in 2021. This is a remarkable book, and I'm sure it will become a kind of uh, Bible for international lawyers in the future, not only because of the beautiful cover and the title, which is very biblical, but also because of the of the dimensions of the of the book, which is uh, uh, which are significant. So Professor Koskeniemi will present a paper uh, titled The Law of International Society, a Road Not Taken, Reflections on One 19th Century Moment. After uh, Marty's presentation, we will open the floor for questions uh, from the audience. Let me say finally that this seminar will be recorded and will be posted online at Queen Mary's and PODES web pages after the event, after a few days. Uh, a few days after the event. Uh, Marty, thank you so much for being here with us today and the floor is yours. Thank you, Alexis, for that uh, introduction and for the invitation for me to give this talk on a topic which is work in progress, very much in progress. Uh, it builds on my previous work, some of which you mentioned, um, and uh, I don't exactly know where it's going to go, but it has to do in general with the uses of the idiom of society. What is it that we mean when we talk about society? How is it that a field such as social sciences has emerged and what does that field study in relationship to adjoining fields such as law and uh, political science or e economics, for example. I'm interested in conceptual history um, and law obviously has lots of concepts, but I'm interested not only in the legal concepts, I'm interested in their relationship with concepts that are commonly believed to belong to other fields, um, other, other disciplinary fields. Um, which also indicates that my present interest is to try to understand the emergence, the nature, and the political project embedded in uh, law, economics, social science, etc. Those disciplines that we where we know and in which we are experts, in which we collaborate uh, with each other. I've been given to understand that in the audience, there are people who are not only lawyers, but others also, and I welcome that. Um, I think we all belong in some sense to a community that studies the world, the same world, uh, but although from uh, different conceptual universes. And so our understandings of that world, including our political projects, 
are different uh, by reference to this framing that we give to them. So, uh, but today I'm going to talk on just one little part of that project, which is about the emergence of, of an idiom, uh, the idiom of international society and the law of international society in the 19th century. So this builds on, on a book that I published 20 years ago, The Gentle Civilizer of Nations. Uh, some of you may know it, but others may not. So I just say that the, the book made the argument that modern international law as we know it was born in the last third of the 19th century, or more specifically, in I date the emergence of modern international law in 1873 with the establishment of the Institut de Droit International, the Institute of International Law, which was the first institutional setting in which men, of course they were all men, could look at each other and recognize themselves and each other as international lawyers as doing something that could be called international law in contradistinction to how they had previously been imagining the field of natural law, of domestic constitutional law in its external application of jus gentium, of uh, droit des gens, of droit public de l'Europe, those idioms that canvassed the international legal uh, interactions before the emergence of modern international law, which, as I suggest, took place in 1873. Uh, when uh, the men of 1873, as I call them, came together to establish the Institut de Droit International, they adopted a statute for the Institut. And in the statute, they identified themselves as the juridical conscience of the civilized world. The project that they had, and that then became the project of 20th century international law, was about liberalism, especially liberalism in Europe, and civilizing the colonies. So it had a twin outlook on the world. As, well, as far as Europe was concerned, European legislation needed to be harmonized in a liberal uh, direction. And as much as the world was concerned, the world was to be civilized, which meant like uh, it should be, everybody should be like Europeans. It projected a hierarchical global order in which a historical view suggested that in due course, everybody would develop as the European states had developed up to that point. Um, now, that's what I said 20 years ago, and I hold hold to that. And I've been interested in, well, what went on before 1873? How did people in Europe, especially, uh, but also uh, in a secondary way, however, as far as my research is concerned, elsewhere, how did they think about the legal relations extending beyond domestic boundaries? And what I find in Europe, especially, is the idea of external public law. The most influential European lawyer in the early part of the 19th century to have written and published and engaged in diplomatic and various institutional activities was Georg Friedrich von Martens. Martens was a professor from the University of Göttingen he was the last in the line of a long line of distinguished professors um, who had studied and written on natural law and jus gentium. Uh, natural law and jus gentium were the ruling idiom under which the Göttingen jurists, as well as German jurists in general and Europeans, had dealt with the topic in the 18th century. Martens published his works in the early 19th century, and he set aside natural law altogether. He didn't, he thought natural law was old fashioned. Natural law could not be verified. Natural law had no empirical reality in the world. 
Instead, his idea of legal science was an, a science of empirical import, a science that had a, an application in the real world of politics and government. And so he published a new textbook with a wholly new idiom, uh, the new textbook, which he called, well, the first editions were in Latin in 1788. Then there was a French edition in the 1790s, and they were rapidly translated into other languages, including to the English language at the request of the government of the United States in Washington. Um, the, uh, the book in the French and the most authoritative version had the name Précis de droit international moderne, moderne de l'Europe. So the a textbook of in modern international law in Europe. And there he defined interna international law as the external public law of individual states. That is to say, the, it, it was the law that domestically was enacted under the domestic constitution by the various states to deal with the country's international relations. Martens rejected the idea that there was any supranational law of any kind. No, all law emerged from the state itself, but the state sometimes legislated in relation to its external affairs. That was external public law. This was a conservative proposition it was an anti-revolutionary proposition. Martins was very clear that he was an anti-revolutionary. And he imagined diplomacy as a legal system. Diplomacy in which the various countries would come together uh, under their own external public law to negotiate treaties. Only treaties were law. That position was taken up by this guy namely uh, Hegel, uh, in whose outlines of the philosophy of right, Hegel uses two idioms that uh, are very interesting for my purposes and for our purposes of trying to understand how Europeans thought about inter-European and global legal relations before 1873. In Hegel, there are two important idioms. In the first place, Hegel agreed with Martens that the only law that was really applicable between states was the ex their external public law, Euseres Staatsre, external public law. There was no supranational law of any kind. But, but then he came up with a second uh, idiom, which was the important idiom of civil society. As some of you may, may well know, Hegel's outlines of the philosophy of right, uh, right canvasses three realms of social interaction, family, civil society, and the state. They are progressively related so that from this subjectivity embodied in state, in, in, in family, something from something like civil society emerges from the relations between families as the realm of need, as he puts it. The commerce would be an important part of the operations of civil society. Civil society, however, is the realm of conflict and convert and conflicting interests. And so civil society can be, must be transcended uh, with the realm of freedom, which is the realm of state for Hegel. Now I'm interested in that, and many other people were as well, um, including lawyers. And one of those lawyers was Lorenz von Stein. Von Stein was a professor of public law uh, from Kiel, the University of Kiel, who had been traveling in France and in 1842 published the first German language report of the post-1830 um, revolutionary thinking in France. Uh, I have noted here the, the German name of his book, 
der Sozialismus und Kommunismus des heutigen Frankreichs. Socialism and Communism in today's France. In this book, for the first time to a German audience, he explained that there was, uh, ever since the Great Revolution, there had been in, in France this developing idea of society. And that the, the problems, the political problems of modern, of the modern world were more problems uh, of society than problems of constitution and politics. Most Germans <clears throat> in the 1830s, 1840s, and in the, pro in the way towards the revolution of 1848, um, uh, were thinking in constitutional terms. Lorenz von Stein was practically the only uh, important interlocutor in those debates who said, no, don't, constitutions don't really matter. What matters is this, this society. And a society embodies conflict between those who own and those who don't own stuff. The property regime, the ownership regime of, uh, of society is the heart of social conflict and that is the nature that is at the heart of modernity. Modernity is precisely that the world in which society becomes central, and society is about the arrangement uh, of property relations. It is about the conflict of property relations, and it uh, it embodies the processes whereby those conflicts should be mediated. Von Stein emphasized, as Hegel had done for the first time, that modern industrial society was different from uh, the previous traditional society. At its heart was labor. And labor was a field in which individuals realized their personality. Personality, however, was not a subjective thing. It was not something that individuals had as individuals. Instead, it was collectively um, uh, as, as assimilated by the, by the position of a person in the labor regime. And the position of a person in the labor regime created the person's personality as well as gave him the interests that he had in relationship to the property regime in society. Now you have to remember, all of this is before Marx. Marx has not yet, or he's starting to write, but, uh, but uh, it's before Marx. And although in France, uh, von Stein had been very influenced by the, uh, the Fourier and Saint-Simon, the ideas of so society and the social, he wasn't a socialist. On the contrary, he was a conservative. And his message to his German audience was, modernity is different. And if you want to avoid revolution, you have to take into account <clears throat> that at its heart is this society in which conflicts uh, emerge and in which social movements emerge that represent specific interests and individuals have a social role through their personality, which embodies their interest in relationship to ownership uh, in society. He was a monarchist. He thought that only uh, a monarchic state could uh, mediate the existing conflicts. All of this was utterly new in Germany. He wrote, he wrote also about the law of nations about Völkerrecht in a series of articles in the 1940s, in which he was critical of the idea that states are central to, uh, to international law. He said, a new uh, international world is emerging. The Monroe Doctrine, 1823, in which the Americans had declared the Western Hemisphere as a special realm of social activity. The German Customs Union, also a, a supranational thing in which trade relations created the 
heart of cooperation between individuals, intensification of treaty making on commercial matters. Private relations were increasing in Europe, Stein wrote, and states had very little to do with those private relations. Also, state life they, was unified. That is to say, the life in the various states, although states were separate, tended to be very similar. And the similarity of life in those societies was determined by reference to the property regime in those states. And as in Europe, there would be many, uh, as in Europe, there would be many um, uh, social conflicts. Those social conflicts united Europe into an into an international social realm in which the statehood of this or that actor was real, but nevertheless just secondary. And he wrote about the idea of a Völkergesellschaft, a society of nations, uh, which he projected would emerge from the industrialization and from the convergence of the interests of social movements across Europe. Now, again, all of this in the 1840s was really new. And he, well, he knew that it was new, and he was proposing that there should be an international law that would take all of these changes into account. Now, here's another German public lawyer, maybe the most famous German public lawyer of the mid-century, Robert von Moll. Von Moll is not just some guy, some public lawyer from Germany. He actually is uh, an important person in the movement to the 1848 revolutions. He becomes uh, elected to the Frankfurt Parliament, the parliament of the short-lived German Republic, and also the Minister of Justice of that German uh, Republic. He was a professor of public law at the University of Heidelberg earlier on. And he uh, was interested in von Stein's writings and, and so, uh, thought to bring forward this idea that it was the social instead of the political understood as relation, in relationship to the constitution that was central to modern life. And he suggested that there should be a new uh, doctrine at the universities, uh, a, Geze a Gesellschaftswissenschaft, that is to say, a science of society that would be parallel to the science of the state. Now, in Germany, the sciences of the science of state, Staatslehre, had a very long and distinguished career. And the Staatslehre had been divided into various uh, subsidiary uh, parts. There was historical Staatslehre, there was Statistik, uh, there was Staatskunde, uh, the uh, political uh, uh, politics, and so on. And he suggested that that alongside these various state disciplines, there should be society disciplines, there should be a historical discipline of society, there should be a, a Gesellschaftskunde, that is to say, a way, the a way to teach about how social formations exist, social associations and social movements, and what are the, the legal relationships or the uh, lawful relationships between those movements, a science of society. Now, I am interested in these men because, because, as I said at the outset, international law in the modern sense had not yet been born. Um, and I had previously been writing about this international law in the modern sense as a, as a project of liberalizing Europe and civilizing the colonies. This was now different, it seemed to me. Uh, in... Eight, in a long essay in 1860, von Moll, that was titled in German, uh, Support of International Society as the, talk of in, as the Task of International Law, the Pflege der Internationalen Gesellschaft as, uh, as, the, as the Task of Völkerrecht, uh, where he proposed that the kind of law put forward by Martens, as I explained at the beginning, external public law, a law 
that uh, emerges from individual states when they enact uh, about their own uh, external activities is quite insufficient in modernity. Instead, what we need is a law of an international society. Um, and there should be a study of international society. He spoke about as social associations that have interests and operate across boundaries. States should support these associations. They should even support foreign associations because those were also often useful for their own purposes. And because the state, in von Maul's view, von Maul was a liberal, old liberal, as they say, and because the state has the task of helping out the projects of their citizens and the citizens organize in social associations, it follows that the state should support those associations. And there are, the, and he listed a, a long list of social associations that, in his view, had various international um, operations that were undergoing or international elements to their activity, associations in the field of, of trade, industry, health, education, criminal assistance, migra migration, refugees, and so on. Um, now, uh, the 1848 revolution obviously failed. Many of the liberals uh, had to flee from Germany. The, uh, the Frankfurt parliament was closed. Prussia took over. The king of Prussia refused to be the ruler of a united Germany uh, in the way that the Frankfurt parliament had suggested it to him and a uh, reaction set in. Von Moll, however, quite exceptionally, could return to his old, old chair in Heidelberg and continue to preach this idea of society as the central thing on which lawyers should focus their attention. Von Stein uh, himself moved to Vienna. Von Stein had also been a member of the Frankfurt Parliament. For those who don't remember this, so the Frankfurt Parliament was uh, a, a liberal concoction of a parliament that was supposed to be the uh, the parliament of a united Germany. Once the Germany would unite, as the liberals had hoped, and and would unite as a republic, not as uh, a monarchy. Now, all of that failed uh, very very rapidly in eighteen by eighteen forty nine. And the, the, the very disappointed liberals then adopted all kinds of subsidiary projects uh, in order to carry out uh, what they could not do di uh, through directly political means uh, in 1948. Von Stein uh, received a position in Vienna where he began to write no longer about society, but about financial law and public law but always inserting in his writings uh, 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 heterodox ideas about the nature of the public realm in its relationship to this other uh, thing, the society. Uh, and in 1882, he came out with a very uh, long and principled article that took again those themes that he had put forward earlier in the century Einige Bemerkungen über das internationale Recht, uh, certain remarks on the international law. He published this very significantly in so-called Schmollers Jahrbuch, uh, uh, a periodical established by one of the founders of, so of German sociology, namely Schmoller, um, uh, with whom he was in correspondence and whose projects uh, including the project of establishing uh, an association of social policy to deal with problems uh, of society he, uh, he supported. And here he, uh, he made an elaborate argument that I've summarized here. We are of the opinion that the time of old Völkerrecht, the natural law-based idea on the one hand, as well as the external public law idea on the other hand had passed 
and the epoch of international recht of the lives of peoples will take over. Now this is obscure and the article is, it's long, but it's also obscure. But what it puts forward is this idea that governance or government must be internationalized in due course. And that um, the domestic administrations will of course remain, but those domestic administrations will have to engage in increasing amount of thinking about international relations in order to carry out the tasks which they are assigned to carry out in their domestic context. So it's a kind of a globalization or transnationalization argument. He of course doesn't use those notions. Instead, the idea of an international society emerges. So by, by the 1880s, the international law as, as I identify it, with the Institut de Droit International, modern international law, liberalism and civilization was already underway. And this idea of an, or this idiom, um, an idea of an international society was not successful. Um, uh, let's see why it was. So many people in the German realm opposed the very idea of society. They thought that this was an a meaningless idiom. It was an old fashioned Hegelian idea, civil society. What, what is that? One of the, the uh, vocal opponents of the very idea of society was Heinrich von Treitschke, um, an old liberal also himself, who later on of course became a very strong supporter of Bismarck's uh, project of, uh, of German uh, of the German state. Uh, and he wrote his habilitation uh, in 1858 already as a refutation of von Moll's idea of social uh, of a social science. There can be no social science. There should be no social science. There should be no social science because the state is the heart of, um, of human relationships and especially the state is the vehicle through which Germany and the German nation can become aware of itself as such and can adopt and should adopt as the a form of its common life. So as part of his uh, effort to support the unification of Germany and of German state, he opposed the idea of society because that could have been used in order to put forward the argument that a, uni a united Germany was not needed because after all, there was already a German society. And so he came out in, 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 this, in his habilitation, but later on in many of his writings by, uh, by the argument that the state is the best and most dignified form of relationships that individuals can take uh, among themselves. They become citizens and as citizens form the kinds of relationships in which the state is always involved in one way or another. So no society. And another person agreed. Now, Johann Kaspar Blunchli uh, was the mo one of the most important German, actually Swiss, but Swiss German public lawyers in the period after Robert von Moll. He actually had to uh, become a refugee from his native Switzerland at the time of uh, Swiss civil war. For those who don't know this, I can just tell you there was a civil war, in, uh, a religiously uh, informed civil war in Germany uh, in the uh, early 19th century. And he uh, eventually found his way to Heidelberg, where von Moll also taught. Uh, Blunchley uh, listened to von Moll and read the productions of von Moll and was dead against this idea of uh, social science. No, law and legal science uh, is sufficient. In every aspect of human relationships, 
the, the, the society, the, the public, and in, sorry, in every aspect of human relationships, either private law or public law are involved. Actually, private law and public law relate to each other like the shoreline and the sea. Everything in society is, uh, is regulated either through private law or public law. And these two laws constitute the idioms through which human relationships can and should be dealt with. Society is nothing. Oh, and here is a quote that I taken from one of his, uh, his articles in which he especially attacks the, the idea of his older colleague, namely the idea of a social science. All institutions of common public life, municipalities, political associations, other associations, churches, have only a relative independence and are always subordinated to the state. Now, I can't dwell with this much longer. Blunchley was an immensely important uh, figure in the emergence of modern international law. As I said, he was the Moore's successor in Heidelberg. He was in the 1870s and 80, 1880s, the leading authority of German uh, public law, of Staatsrecht. And he became one of the founders of the Institut de Droit International. He actually was the person from whose pen the founders of the, this institute, the institute that I identify as the epitome of this modern idea of an international law as, as, as a convergence of liberal ideas in Europe and the civilization of, uh, of the colonies. He is the author of the statute of, the, uh, of that institute and of the expression that the institute as well as international law is the juridical conscience of the civilized world. Now that locution, that expression is twice significant. On the one hand, it identifies law as a matter of conscience or uh, of consciousness. The uh, French original conscience has this interesting double meaning, both as conscience, the romantic touch to it, and, and, and consciousness, um, a classical rationalist uh, touch to it. But, the, but what's important there is that the, it identifies law not as an enactment by public power, not as the legal uh, enactment, not as positive law, but something embedded in the conscience. Now, this idea is uh, a key idea of the historical school in Germany, of Zavigny. And Blunchley had been, as a young man, Zavigny's uh, pupil and had written on Zavigny um, and was an admirer, not a full-scale historical person, but nevertheless, the idea that law exists somewhere inside the people. That is the idea of, that is the heart of, uh, of the Blunchleyan idea and of the historical school. Now, if you talk about international law, Obviously, you cannot just examine a people because there are many peoples. And what is it that unites those many peoples? It is civilization for Blunchley. And civilization, and this is the second important aspect of this uh, quote, civilization is a hierarchical notion. Some people are more advanced in civilization. Others are less advanced. And this idea of, of uh, a hierarchical world of international life is the heart of modern international law as it builds itself on this idea that, that uh, law is an informal expression of civilization with the unsaid but well understood idea that the peak of civilization exists in Europe. And so but this is where I will end. And so at the time of the establishment of modern international law, 
I see t a, a competition between two idioms. The idiom of society, which represents the ideals of the revolution of 1848, and maybe also the ideas of the earlier revolution, 17, uh, 1789 and 1790s, the, in its various variants, when it focuses on social life in its multiform aspects. And on the other hand, this idea of civilization as a hierarchical um, arrangement and a historical arrangement in which there is a historical trajectory in which all peoples and all nations are situated, in which some are further advanced than others. In this competition between these two idioms, society and civilization, civilization won. And therefore, 20th century international law became highly hierarchical. Its heart was Europe and European ideas about political activity, about international relations. The League of Nations, as well as the United Nations later on, are based on modernist ideas about development and modernization. Development and modernization, which are both translations of the civilizational idea or, and the idea of a historical teleology underwriting uh, legal and political developments in the world. Now, in the course of the 20th century, every now and then, the idea of international society has come up. We can identify a number of lawyers and non-lawyers who suggest that there is an international society or that there should be an international society. In, in the field of international relations, Hedley Bull is well known of having put forward the idiom of the international as an anarchical society, a paradoxical uh, expression that tries to put together this idea of society as developed by the, uh, the socialists, socialists in the specific sense that I've been uh, dealing with, of the early 19th century, as well as civilizational men of the late uh, 19th century. Anarchic society, which in a sense is not a society if it's anarchic, and it's not anarchic if it's a society. This is an oxymoron, obviously, and Bull knew this. Um, but in putting it forward, he, I, from my perspective, was aware that this battle, if you want to call it that, in this struggle between uh, different idioms and with them different projects of human organization continued through the 20th century. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Marty. Uh, and that, that's perfect timing. Thank you also for that. I have many questions and I can imagine uh, that people in the audience will have uh, many questions as well. So let's- I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to plug this computer. Otherwise, otherwise I will be lost. Yes, yes, sure. So let, let's open the floor. Please uh, write your questions in the chat or alternatively uh, raise your hand, either uh, your real or your virtual hand. In any case, please be brief uh, to allow our people uh, to, to ask questions. So the floor is open. Yeah. Yes. Ramiro, please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Alexis, for inviting us to this interesting conference of uh, Professor Koskeniemi, very, very much again for your reflection, very interesting for us. I am Ramiro Riera from Buenos Aires, for the, from the University of Buenos Aires, member of the <clears throat> group of uh, critical studies on law and politics and society. So to be, to be very, very brief, I want to ask to Professor Koskeniemi if he finds some relation between the idea of a juridical conscience of 
the civilized world with the concept of universal juridic and conscious and consciousness uh, from the former judge of the International Court of Justice, uh, Augusto Antonio Cansado Trindade. If you find uh, any relation in between these uh, uh, both concepts, uh, if they are different, of, or in any case, if uh, one is the continuity of the other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ramiro. Mati, would you like to answer? Uh, yes, I, yes, I have a ready answer here. Okay. So, uh, so Canchado Trindad's work that I'm very familiar with is a complete continuation of the civilizational mode. And I, of course, identify the civilizational mode as Eurocentric and conservative. Um, and I, I identify, I always identified Cantado as uh, in this mode as a, as a conservative for this, for the, for Blunchley and for the early international lawyers in the late 19th century, socialism was one of the great enemies that they wanted to go against. They were worried about the international labor movement, for example. And in establishing the Institute of International Law as a, as a closed club of, uh, of men, of European men, uh, of elite Europeans, they made clear that, for instance, religious um, cosmopolitans or, or socialists could never enter uh, that professional realm. Um, and I think to, throughout the 20th century, we can see the civilizational rhetoric emerge over and over again, not always expressly using the idea of civilization, because uh, with decolonization and with the very powerful criticism that that in the UN period, third world countries and third world lawyers uh, made against the use of the expression of civilization in law and in it, and in, in the UN context, other, other idioms were used, development especially. Um, but I completely think that the kind of neo-natural law of which Cansado was a representative was a reactionary um, aspect of international law that we well, that we saw throughout the 20th century being the main uh, strand of international law. Thank you, Marty. So we have two questions in the chat. Uh, I will read them uh, together because I think they are connected. So the first question is, society has several hierarchies within it. How would a world system work if society had one? How could international law function without a hierarchical structure that civilization provided? So this is the, the first question. And the second question is, the beliefs in the hierarchization of society in international law are still very present in international lawmaking. What can history teach us in, ad in addressing this Society has hierarchies now. Yes, of course, that's true. But in the 19th century, what I'm interested in what that the people who were writing on international matters, people who were observing modernity emerge through industrialization, through increasing commerce, through the um, homogeneous nature of the interests of labor across uh, countries, those people were trying to find ways in which to address vocabularies in which to address modernity in those terms. There were many different um, alternatives. As I said, for this, for international law, civilization won. Uh, or in many other fields, society won. So social sciences became something. It didn't become a part of law. It became its own discipline. Um, and the and uh, Durkheim in France, Max Weber in Germany were precisely interested in trying to find an idiom through which to give an articulation 
to non-traditional ways of life that they saw emerging around Europe and the United States uh, uh, especially. And they chose the idiom of society to think about it. Uh, now, now, by the 20th century, society, that idiom had already become relatively commonplace and the, the de facto hierarchies that exist in society uh, could be embodied within that the, the, the idiom of society. But when it arose, when the idiom arose in the context of post-revolutionary French society, the idiom was meant to challenge and put to question the existing traditional hierarchies that existed there. I'm not naive to, to think that if we now, if, if some god would now enact society or international society as our ruling discipline, then, you know, hierarchies would mm -hmm. disappear. Of course they would. Mm -hmm. Hierarchies are not created by, um, by concepts, but hierarchies are upheld and, uh, and crystallized in concepts and conceptual uh, developments are indications of um, uh, of both revolutionary and reactionary movements uh, in society. Uh, so I don't, right. So that's my response to the first question. The second question, can you remind me? It was shorter and maybe easier yes. to read. Uh, the second was the beliefs in the hierarchization of society in international law are still very present in international lawmaking. What can history teach us in addressing this? Well, what history can teach us is that the present structures of political decision making that govern both states and the interstate real are not carved in stone. That they emerged at a certain moment through certain struggles, struggles that could have gone the other way. And if one is critical of the hierarchies of the present, if one thinks that the, let's say, the distribution of material and spiritual values today in the world is unjust, it's not a very revolutionary thing to think. But I think that, and I suspect that many of you think that, then we have an interest in not thinking of the present structures of distribution, for example, as carved in stone as perpetual, as necessary, necessary because they emerged in, through some historical law that could not go other, uh, in an, any other way. A historical study that shows the disputed, controversial origin of something, in this case, the disputed and controversial origin in which we think about the international world opens an avenue of challenging the present uh, arrangements present distribution of material and, and spiritual values, present property relations, present regimes of, let's say, investment arbitration, uh, just to pick a, a not so random example. Uh, and so why these historical studies are important from a critical perspective, they are important. There are many reasons, but perhaps the most important is that they show that the present is just a, uh, um, a, a creation of accidents and struggles, and that they can be put, the present can be put to question uh, just as it was put into uh, to question in the past. We have uh, one more question uh, in the chat, Marty. So the question is from Jose Vecido. Uh, so he says, thank you, that was very interesting. Uh, he asked, however, if it's not industrialization, a way of seeing the world and hence to see society. And is there not a genealogy of Christian religion in that perspective? Is not industry a substitute of re or religion in, in that sense, a substitute of religion in that sense? <laughs> well, that's a hard one. So Max Weber, obviously, thought that much about religion and especially the position of Protestantism 
in society explained many of the things uh, of modernity that could not be otherwise explained. Um, other uh, sociologists, and I see Roger Cotterell uh, there, uh, other social, uh, who knows this thing much better than I, uh, so other sociologists have put to question the significance of religion in the creation of modernity. I think at present there is a resurgence of interest in seeing the ways in which a theology is embedded in secular institutions, or let's put it the other way around, so that secular institutions are embedded in what can be reasonably imagined as theological ways of thinking and acting and feeling. Um, I'm sympathetic to, to that understanding. I'm sympathetic to the ideas that capitalism and theology is a, is a political theology or embodies a political theology of sorts. Um, I th I, I, one of the controversial but sharp thinkers of this would have been Carl Schmitt, uh, but not only Schmitt. Uh, other, others as well in the 20th century have suggested that what we have been accustomed to identifying a secular modernity with its commercial mores, with its industrialization, with its labor conflicts, etc., actually is embedded in a hidden theological, you know, in a hidden uh, political theology. Uh, let me say, I, I, I remain agnostic about, <laughs> about that. I think that opens an avenue, um, but for my purposes, my purposes here would be to put to question the civilizational ethos of modern institution. It's not necessary to uh, go in that direction, although I'm interested in reading people who do go in that direction, and I'm now seeing Professor Cotterell raise his hand, so I'm really interested to hear what he has to say. Please, please, Roger, go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you for a wonderful lecture, Marty. Um, I, I'm, I, I, I'm no expert, of course, in international law, but I am very interested in the, um, the sporadic contributions to the sociology of international law, which have been developed over a very long period, and of course, uh, and are still important today. And I wondered if you have any comments about whether it's possible to generalize about this continuing consistent effort to introduce sociological thought into international law in, in a systematic way, whether this represents in any way a kind of countercurrent to the um, emphasis on civilization rather than society. Uh, you know, whether it can actually be generalized as a movement of some sort in international law. Well, uh, thank you very much, Roger. Um, yes, that's precisely what I think. Um, in the 20th century, a number of uh, lawyers, both international lawyers, but more frequently, legal theorists have tried to give an articulation of present international relations in legal terms through the employment of sociological metaphors and sociological concepts and so on. Um, in some sense, I think that the emergence of international relations as a discipline in the early 20th century we, together with the establishment of the League of Nations, the uh, the chair in Aberystwyth, for example, uh, with uh, um, uh, with Adolf Zimmern and E. H. Carr, mm -hmm. and I suppose um, uh, Hedley Bull. So the English School uh, of International Relations. So that is born out of a wish to think of uh, international relations. Through so through social thinking, mm -hmm. um, and 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 that is also one of the reasons I think why it has always been so easy for lawyers and the English school people to work together, <laughs> and so I, I've found uh, the writings of the English school very useful for understanding international law myself, 
way more uh, useful than the American international relations people who tend to go by rational choice and Hans Morgenthau's Nietzschean metaphysics and, or a combination of those those two. So the the English school is, is really useful here. Now, uh, I have two things to say about the international legal writings uh, in the 20th century on sociology. One, one is that those writings always come from heterodox right, international lawyers, either heterodox in connection because they come from the third world, from outside Europe, sometimes from the United States, but not from people who are elected to the International Court of Justice or to otherwise hold the most um, important positions in the profession of international law itself. Alejandro Alvarez, uh, who was uh, one of the uh, the students of the French sociological school that Durkheim and Duguy and those people created. Uh, so he was an important international lawyer from the third world. I think um, also to take a present example, Georges Abissab uh, from, um, fr from the North Africa, but now in Geneva uh, in his 90s, uh, and an important actor in the new international economic order, but also a very, pre very powerful professional international lawyer, a member of the appellate body of the WTO at one point. So, so he was very interested, is very interested in sociology and social thinking. So that's one thing. So the third world people come with a sociological vocabulary to international law. Not always very successfully, but there are exceptions. A second Second line of thinkers then come from the United States, from Roscoe Pound and these people. Pound um, early on had uh, a research assistant, Julius Stone. Now Stone is some is a is an important person in his own right as a legal theorist, but he was an international lawyer. He wrote lot, uh, much on international law, and he was the first one who who took the idea of a sociology of international law in those terms seriously. He gave a series of, uh, of, of lectures at the Hague Academy of International Law in 1956, if I recall correctly, on the sociology of international law. The 1950s and 1960s, also some other US-based uh, lawyers, not international lawyers though, which I, I may make this point because if you are not an international lawyer, then you and you don't have the internal view of an international lawyer, then your sociology tends to be how would I put tends to stay outside the profession itself. It's easier to exclude it. Um, mm. But Stone and and a few other Americans tried this in the fifties and sixties, um, but that never really amounted to much. I'm now teaching at Harvard presently. Um, I'm teaching my. I have to do a little bit of uh, advertisement here, teaching this new book that I just published with my colleague, David Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, in the United States, there is no international law of a European type to, to uh, at all. So that's over. So that project of, uh, of liberalizing and civilizing, that's over. And that may be a good thing. And the Americans are running in all kinds of directions. And, and I would say one of the reasons for why there is no international law of a European character here in, in, in the United States has to do with the prevalence of legal realism. And legal realism obviously is a sociologically insightful way mm -hmm. of to think about uh, the law. And it, it was unable to penetrate international standard international law because standard international law, my gentle civilizers, are not in whatever we can say about them are not insightful sociological thinkers about international relations <laughs> so that's a complex uh, and lengthy response i'm really interested in this topic and i hope that whilst i'm working my way up from the germans i will one day be able to produce uh, a narrative of sociological thinking in the international world. But I recognize that as a huge amount of work to be done in order to be there. Thank you, Marty. I look forward to that. <laughs>
Let, let me add, Marty, that the book came out just a month ago and that there will be a, a, a book presentation next week, if I'm not wrong, right? Is it next week, right? Okay, it's next week. So if you if you Google yes, it, it's it next will, week. you will find the details. I think it will be online as well, right? Um, yeah, I think so. I think, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we have time for one last question. We have five minutes more. So if uh, somebody has a question, please go ahead. Okay, yes, Paulette. Yeah, hello. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, I am PhD of the University of Zurich. I originally come from Chile. Also, I am familiar with, with Alvarez and, and the School of Latin America International Lawyer. And part of my PhD research was the influence of Jeremy Bentham and the Peace Project in Latin America. If, if you can tell me or something related how the Peace Project were penetrated the international law world and were influenced, uh, that will be great. Thank you very much, Professor Tostini. Yes, no, now, in the, in the 19th century, the, the various peace projects, not only the Benthamite project, but also the, the general, but mostly Anglo-American uh, peace project, which had some little Frank, Frank, French uh, relations to it. So that uh, had a really troubled relationship with international law. Uh, and, and when international law then was born, in my terms, in 1873, the lawyers themselves wanted to exclude the pacifists from their project altogether. They felt that these, uh, so, uh, the um, especially the American clergymen who were touring Europe in the 1860s and 1870s, sometimes with sometimes with a specific brief given to them by the by the peace movement, sometimes at their own initiative, um, they were they met with European lawyers, but usually the lawyers were very skeptical about their propositions and didn't think that those propositions could really be realizable uh, in the way that the peace, uh, the pacifists um, were putting forward. The peace movement also had a professional difficulty to the extent that, that from the lawyer's perspective, it was overly concentrated on the idea of not waging war. The lawyers wanted to be legal advisors to their governments and often acted as such. And their governments did think that going to war every now and then was useful, albeit they were quite happy to subscribe to the Red Cross Convention from 1864 and to the ideology of uh, the laws of war that came with uh, the Red Cross um, and, and the rest of, rest of it. So the lawyers were not ready to say that law should be, I'm sorry, that war should be made illegal or impossible. <laughs> and that that created a, a really difficult um, move, a set of conversations. There is a, there is this new work coming out on the relations between the peace movement and, um, uh, and international law in the 19th century. Um, but I, I forget the name of the, uh, so the person who is, is, is working on this is, is working in Brussels at the Free University of Brussels. Um, and his argument is that the, that the peace movement itself, both in the United States as well as in the UK, again, I have to say the peace movement was mostly Anglo-American. Um, so it created its own international legal vocabulary. Um, and although most of the peace movement people were not lawyers, some were, um, they tried, as especially towards the end of the 19th century, to develop that vocabulary into a more professional direction. And that was when the, when the movement started to advocate arbitration. So the, the successful conclusion of the Alabama arbitration in 1872 uh, suggested to the peaceniks that we should now 
no longer be mm, hardcore pacifists, or at least that should no longer be our our image. Instead, we should be advocates of arbitration. And they were able to establish the uh, the what became the Interparliamentary Union. I, I forget now what its original name was, but this is an 1870s uh, thing. Uh, yeah, or, or under the the theme of there should be more arbitration. Um, but, but the but the matters came to a clash in the autumn of 1873 uh, when the uh, when the peace um, activists came to Europe and spoke to the leading lawyers, including Blunchley um, and others. And I have I have written on this in the first chapter of my gentle civilizer of nations. Um, they met with each other uh, in, with the idea of establishing an association that would have both peace activists and lawyers in it. Nothing came of that. And so the lawyers established the closed, closed club of the Institut de Droit International on the 8th of September, 1873. And one month thereafter, the peaceniks established also in Brussels, or also in Belgium, the, uh, the institute was established in Ghent, in, in Belgium. In Brussels, the International Law Association, or, or, or which the, with the original name of the Association for the Codification and Development of International Law, which, which is not a closed club, but which is an open association. Both of these institutions exist today, their, their relations now are much better than they used to be at the beginning. But at the beginning, the very establishment of these two associations, the Institut de Droit International, the International Law Association, be, was an embodiment of the conflict between the lawyers, the hardcore lawyers, and the pacifist ideologues, theologians and lawyers and socialists and whatever people and feminists, obviously, <laughs> were part of that as well. But I, I advise you to, well, you can be in contact with me by email, and I'll send you the uh, the work that has been done by this uh, person whose name now escapes me. I mean, you know, age, you can see my age now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. We have two more uh, questions in the chat. But you know, I'm aware that you have to leave very soon uh, for another meeting. Uh, so I'm very sorry uh, because these two questions are very interesting. They're about the several approaches to international law, and I would have loved to to listen your answer, Marty. I'm sorry for for I'm sorry with the MJ and with Ismail, but you know our time is up. Maybe we can ask those questions to Marty the next time. So thank you so much. Marty, again, for being with us today. Thank you for that uh, wonderful presentation. And we are very looking forward to your new book. Uh, thank you all uh, for joining us today. Please join us for next week for the next session, which will be next week on Tuesday. Uh, this is November 7. Uh, this will be the second session of the Critical Legal Talk series. We will have Professor Christoph Menke, uh, who will be presenting his work on democracy and rights and the very tense relationship between these two, these two spheres. So you can register using the link I posted in the chat. And yes, that's all. Thank you so much. And see you next time, hopefully next week. Bye. Thank you for Thank my you for part. Well, I've enjoyed this very much. And, and this is always very useful for <laughs> me to, to speak on work in progress. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so you much. Thank you very much, Professor.